أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا والصلاة على من أذهب عنهم الرجس أهل البيت وطهرهم تطهيرا قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين ظل سعيهم في الحياة الدنيا وهم يحسبون أنهم يحسنون الصنعاء My respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum If you look at faith, faith is really a pyramid which has a number of stages and varying degrees and numerous echelons. That's why our eighth Imam, he comes and he mentions a narration who shows to us that faith has a number of degrees and phases. He says, Iman is a phase higher than Islam. And he also says that Taqwa is a phase higher than Iman. And Yaqeen is a phase higher than Taqwa. And above Yaqeen, there is no other stage. Meaning just as to every pyramid, there is a peak. The peak of Islam, the peak of faith, is seen as certitude or certainty. In the Arabic language, translated as Yaqeen. And it's for that reason, you'll see there is an unbelievable emphasis about this whole notion of Yaqeen within the Holy Quran and even within the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt <coughs> alayhi salam You'll see, for example, within the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions for us two different kinds of Yaqeen, Surah Al-Takathur, and three within the whole Quran, being Ayn Al-Yaqeen, Ilm Al-Yaqeen, and also Haq Al-Yaqeen. The ability to see certainty, knowledge of certainty, and the truth of certainty, actual, uh, known as Haq Al-Yaqeen. A very beautiful analogy that is typically given by the books is that they tell us علم اليقين is to see the smoke of the fire, for example. This leads you to the conclusion that there must be a fire there, knowledge of the certainty. عين اليقين is to actually see the fire. You see the flames and you have certainty that the fire exists. Whereas حق اليقين is when you're actually in the fire. Your senses are touching the fire. Not only do you see it, not only do you have knowledge of it, but you're there, you're burning within the fire. And this could be applied also to our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As in, many of us have ilm al yaqeen The idea that we have knowledge of Allah. Those who have ayn al yaqeen in regards to Allah's existence, it's almost as if they see Allah. That's why they would come to Imam Ali salam, they would tell him, Ya Ali, hal ra'ayt Allah? Have you seen Allah? He would say, وَيْحَكَ كَيْفَ أَعْبُدَ رَبَّ لَمْ أَرَهَ He would say, woe be unto you, how could I worship a Lord which I don't see? He would tell him, how do you see Allah? He would say, لَا تَرَاهُ الْأَعْيُنِ بَلْ تَرَاهُ الْقُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ He would say, eyes don't see him, but the hearts within the chest see man. That's why one of the techniques and the advice that Ahlul Bayt give us when worshiping Allah, they say, اعبدوا الله وكأنك تراه وَإِنَّكَ إِنْ لَمْ تَرَهْ فَعَلَمْ بِأَنَّهُ يَرَاكَ The hadith comes and says, Worship Allah as if you see Him. And if you cannot picture seeing Allah, then worship Him as if He is seeing you. Meaning this is seen as عين اليقين, where I have the ability to have a perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not in a physical sense. Allah does not have a shape. But in the idea where you have such a close understanding of Allah, that's almost as if you see Him. That's why one of the hadith of uh, the sermons of Al-Muttaqeen actually, where Imam Ali salam describes the believers, he says, وَهُمْ وَالْجَنَّةِ كَمَنْ قَدْ رَآهَا He says, them and the heaven, it's as if they see it. وَهُمْ وَالنَّارُ كَمَنْ قَدْ سَمِعَ زَفِيرُهَا And it's almost as if they hear the flames of, of hell torching and crackling. They hear the fire. This is عَيْنُ يَقِيمُ حق اليقين in regards to Allah isn't that you only have knowledge of Allah. Not only do you have the ability to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you become one with Allah. 
Just like you're within the fire, with Allah, you become one with Him. As we mentioned in previous lectures, you begin to do things with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your support, He will be your divine insurance. That's why the ayah comes and says, in If you give victory to Allah, Allah will give victory to you. This is yaqeen within the Holy Quran. When it comes to the ahadith, you'll see there's a surfeit of material in regards to the notion of certainty. You'll see within the book of the collection of the aphorisms of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, which has nearly 62, 52 ahadith just speaking about the notion of certainty, Imam mentions very interesting lines about the idea of certainty. For example, in hadith number 18, he comes and he says that Al-Iman Sudq Al-Yaqeen or Al-Deen Sudq Al-Yaqeen Religion is truthful certainty Furthermore, Imam Ali alayhi salam he mentions in hadith number 41 of, of this book he says he who doesn't have certainty is as if he doesn't have religion Notice the importance of Yaqeen Yaqeen is seen as the head meaning a human without a head is a dead human being and likewise religion without certainty is seen as dead religion and then Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen comes and he mentions a very interesting line in hadith number 44 where he says, نَوْمٌ عَلَىٰ يَقِينٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن صَلَاةٍ فِي شَكٍ He says, sleeping with certainty is better than praying with doubt. Look at the lines of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. Praying with doubt is inferior to one who sleeps with certainty. Now you'll see within the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the word yaqeen in 20 different locations in various different forms. For example, Allah comes and says, يُقِنُون يَقِينَ وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا Or in Dua Kumail, Allah comes and says, or in Dua Al-Fitaah, I'm sorry, وَأَيْقَنْتُ أَنَّكَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّحَمِينَ You see, Yaqeen is used in many different formats, nearly 20 different places within the Holy Quran, Allah speaks about Yaqeen. Yaqeena. كَذَبُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا جَحَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسَهُمْ Their souls began to inspire them with certainty. You'll see Allah uses it in a number of ways. Now you'll see interestingly when we look at the world today and you examine the reaction of people of other beliefs, you come to a conclusion that they must have certainty in that which they're believing in. <coughs> Not to put them all in the same basket, but you'll see the Christian for example on Good Friday he comes and he mourns the agonizing pain that Jesus, son of Mary, went through. You'll see tears running down his cheek. An average human would say that must be sincerity because tears can't be faked. And if tears are falling, that must be a sign of the sincerity and certainty that the Christian has in the crucifixion of Jesus. You'll see, for example, the Hindu. There's this very famous ritual of the Hindus known as Thimithi, where on an annual basis in places such as Malaysia, South India, Indonesia, they come together and they begin to walk on burning embers of fire to evoke and show gratitude to their gods. Somebody who walks on fire must have certainty that what he's doing is correct. Not an average human being walks on fire. Sitting on the baseline, you'll say that must be yaqeen, that must be certainty. Furthermore, you'll see, for example, the, the Wahhabi terrorist. He comes and he detonates himself having certainty that he'll be sitting with the Prophet, with his 72, you know, relaxing in the heavens. This must be certainty. Is it certainty? Now, within the Holy Quran, Allah uses certainty in nearly 20 different locations. Never did he use the term certainty in regards to those who have beliefs in that which is wrong. Meaning, Allah when he says yaqeen, he only says you can have yaqeen in something correct. Therefore, the question is, a Christian, when he cries in regards to the Good Friday for the mourning of the agonizing pain of Jesus, could we say that is certainty? The Wahhabi comes and he detonates himself, expecting to be with the Prophet and enjoying the, the, the satisfaction and the, the, the luxury that paradise has to come to offer for him with the 72 virgins, for example. Is that certainty? The Hindu, he comes and he walks on fire believing that he's going to evoke and show gratitude to his Lord. Is that certainty? Now, firstly, you have two kinds of certainty. You have perceived certainty, and then you have actual certainty. Actual certainty is that I come and I see something is red, and I have belief it's red. It really is red. 
Yeah, if you come to a human being and for a year you tell him that this is red and you put him under torture and you tell him, if you don't believe this is red, I'm gonna kill you, it's really blue, it's red, it's red. Eventually, psychologically, the human being will begin to see something which is red. This is perceived certainty. Psychologically, your mind could believe in it. That's why you'll see, if they say one day there was a family in their backyard, they were having a barbecue, and all of a sudden a child saw something coming out from the tank and he said gas is coming out of the tank. People began to inhale it, they began to panic, they all fell unconscious. When the investigators came, they wanted to see how is gas leaking from this tank, they realized it was air the entire time. There was no gas. But psychologically the people had certainty in the idea that this must be gas their bodies reacted to it. Meaning, perceived certainty is that if your mind tends to believe in it, psychologically your mind buys it, the heart and the body will begin to react to it submissively. That's why you'll see, the minute you want to know if something is real certainty or not, test it intellectually, logically challenge it. One of the best barometers <coughs> and exposés to real certainty from fake certainty is if you challenge it intellectually. If you believe, if intellectually it meshes logically with you, then it's real. If it doesn't, if it's only emotion, you'll notice it's fake. That's why you'll see the problem with atheism is that they have the conviction of their mind but they don't have the submission of the heart. They removed faith from the picture. You see, Christianity, with all the respect we have for our Christian brethren, they have the conviction and the submission of the heart, but intellectually, they're not able to prove what they believe in. One of the most tragic things a, tr a Christian friend will come and tell you you can do in the church is to pose questions in the church. The minute you become too inquisitive and you ask too much questions, the church doesn't like it. Why? Because you're intellectually challenging it. That's why I remember in ninth grade, I was sitting down in my world religion class and the teacher would bring in a priest to explain to us the Trinity. So he begins to take the chalk, he writes down the Father, the Holy Son, and then the Ghost. The Son and the Holy Ghost. So then I raise my hand, I tell him, excuse me, Mr. Priest, um, with all due respect, but I have a quick question for you. Is, is God seen as something which is infinite or is he seen as something which is finite? He would tell me, no, no, God is, God is infinite. I told him, is Jesus infinite or is he seen as something which is finite? He told me, Jesus is finite. I told him, if I'm not mistaken, I see a clear clash here. You're telling me Jesus is finite, whereas God is infinite. How could the two come together and still be considered to be God? God doesn't eat, Jesus eats. He'd tell me, you know, my friend, you're, you look like a smart boy, but you have to have faith. I told him, I really appreciate the compliment, but could you please give me an answer which is based on logic? He told me, son, you have to have faith, and faith will get you very far. You'll see logically, the minute you challenge it, he begins, the foundation begins to shake. That's why if you turn the TV on a typical Christian evangelical TV channel, you'll see the priest, he, ins he can inspire a rock. Iraq will begin to cry when he listens. He has the most phenomenal words. He speaks as if, you know, he's gonna instill a revolution in your heart. Believe in this, believe in that God is merciful. I don't disagree, God is the most merciful. Allah is Alham al Yet yeah, give me something substantial. If you wanna know if a speaker is saying things which are right or things which are wrong, write down what he says. And when you go back home, look at it. A lot of times, because the way you say it, people begin to buy it. Yet the minute you write it down, you say, you write down, for example, a number of notes, you go back home, you read it, it says, do not lie, do not cheat. Wait, that's all he was saying. But when you say it with passion, people will begin to buy it. Because we do live in a world where if you market something properly, people will buy it regardless, even if it's a bad product. But if you have a good product and you don't market it properly, nobody's gonna buy it. I can come and I, for Marlboro, for example, You'll see how many people smoke in the world today. How many people, for example, drink alcohol in the world today? You'll see 64% of Americans drink alcohol, yet 22,000 die yearly because of alcohol. Why? Because when you see the marketing of such unbelievable products, you'll see the way they perceive it. You'll see the train coming for the Budweiser and snow beginning to fall, and somebody walks in the train and he comes out and all of a sudden he's, he's wearing better clothes and he's as if he's just, you know, went through a whole massage you feel so relaxed. You see it psychologically, you buy it. Marketing is phenomenal, people begin to buy it. On the flip side, you see, if you have the best product, if you don't market it properly, nobody's gonna buy it. This is where Islam fell. 
Islam has the best product but the worst marketing. Non-Muslims have the worst product but the best marketing. You'll see, for example, on the Vajelka TV channel, you see he's talking things which are not so substantial. There isn't too much truth to what he's saying. But the way he says it, with the passion, with the charisma, is what makes that nonsense sound sensical. You flip it on a Muslim TV channel, you'll see an old man sitting down. No, no disrespect for old people. You'll see him sitting down, and the background isn't so professional. The way that he's dressed is in the best of ways. But you'll see he's throwing jewels at you. He's throwing pearls at you. He's giving you tawheed like never before. Philosophy like never before. But the way he's saying it doesn't cause the, the audience to buy that which he's saying. Allah comes in and says, if you market it properly, then people will begin to buy it. Islam fell in this notion. Now, when you challenge it intellectually, you'll realize it begins to shake. Islam is a religion that comes and says, ask, 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 because we have a foundation of intellect. And the more you challenge it, not the further will you disbelieve in it, the more you'll begin to believe in it. This is what Islam says. Dig deeper, and the deeper you go, the more jewels you'll begin to find. Therefore, you'll see perceived psychology, or perceived sincere or certainty, is the idea that if your mind buys it, your heart will submit to it. Yet the minute you challenge it intellectually, you'll begin to see that it shakes. Therefore, you'll see a Christian, you'll see tears falling down. And when we speak about Christians, it's not an attempt to defame them, or to the Jew, for example, or even to the atheist, because Islam doesn't attack people personally. But when you give truth, it's an effort to give him some of the medicine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with. That's why the Quran is known as Shifa'ul Sudur. It's a cure for that which is in the hearts. Therefore, what the Christian has, and the Jew has, and even the Wahhabi who detonates himself, is it known as certainty, or is there a different word? You can't say certainty. What's the definition of it? You'll see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Holy Quran, He gives for each group a trap which they slipped in, which separated them from true yaqeen, true certainty. You'll see in regards to the Christians, Allah gives a term. In regards to the Jews, Allah gives a term. And even in regards to the munafiqeen, who we can refer to as the terrorist who considers himself a Muslim, but does things which are an exact contradictory to Islam, Allah gives a term for them as well. In Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah comes and gives us two different terms for the Christian theology and the idea of where did they slip, and into Jewish theology in regards to where they slip. In Surah Al-Fatiha, Allah says, He can Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Malik, Yom, Al-Deen, Iyaka Na'abudu, Iyaka Nasta'in, Al-Deen, Al-Sarat, Al-Mustaqim, Sarat, Al-Ladeen, An'amta Alayhim. Allah says, guide us to the path which you have blessed. غير المغضوب عليهم Not the path which you have doomed. ولا الظالين. Allah comes and gives us three groups in this chapter. Number one, Mustaqim. Al-Deen, Al-Sarat, Al-Mustaqim. The path which is straight. Firstly, Allah lays a premise. He then explains to us who are the ones who have been established on the path of Mustaqim. Notice he didn't keep it general. He specified. He said, Sarat al Mustaqim, who are they? Sarat al Ladina and Amta Alayhim. The path which I have given blessing. Now, the beauty of the Quran is that you can do tafsir on the Quran through the Quran. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Fasir al Quran abil Quran. Understand Quran through Quran. When Allah comes and says, Sarat al Mustaqim are those who I have an'amta alayhim, I have blessed them. I go to the Quran and I see where has Allah used an'amta. Once again, blessed. You'll see the clearest of verses where Allah says, Through these people I have perfected your blessings. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. Today on this day I perfected your religion and completed your blessings. Meaning what Allah comes and says صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم. He then comes and says on the day of غدير أتممت عليكم نعمتي. Allah saying what? He's saying through Muhammad and Al Muhammad the blessings of Allah have been completed. And then Allah continues. Number one, He says there is a path which is perfect, a path which has been set on the right path. Alam al-Tabatabai, he gives us a very beautiful analogy. He says, Sarat al-Mustaqim is as if there is a road and they walked on it perfectly. They reached from point A to point B safely. They followed the road and the route and the map. Vaaleen, those who have been led astray, are walking on the path. And then they slipped and they began to take another route. Innocently they slipped. 
Allah for the Christians, He says they fell in ضلالah. They were led astray. Innocently they were led astray. In what sense? Much different than the Jews, which will come to the Jews. Allah says maghdubi alayhi for the Jews, the one who have been doomed, but we'll come to that later on. Ghalil is that you'll see that he saw a man who's performing miracles. He says, man doesn't perform miracles. This man's resurrecting the dead. He's walking on water. He's curing the sick from leprosy. This must be something. He must be a man. He must be God. He cannot be inside. His son doesn't do these kinds of things. Despite the fact that the Bible comes and establishes the unicity of God, even in Deuteronomy, you'll see chapter 6, verse number 4, Jesus would come to the people. He would tell them, say, O people of Israel, God is one. You'll notice this trinity came 300 years after St. Paul, or after Jesus, by St. Paul, in the Council of Nicaea. You'll see he came and he saw miracles being performed. He said, this must be God, it cannot be insan. Therefore, what happened? Valala. Innocently, they were led astray. Meaning, in regards to the Christian, he separated himself from the true religion, but he still believes he has it. In, re in essence, the true religion has been completely miscalculated and misinterpreted, and as one would say, corrosion has taken place on the, on the, on the religion of Christianity. It has misrouted from true Islam. Allah says in Nadina and Allah Islam, there is one God. What did they do? They saw a man who was very, rather phenomenal. They said he cannot be a man. He is God. Meaning the Christians within their hand, they have a rock, but they see a jewel. The Wahhabi, he has a jewel, but he sees a rock. Wahhabi is different. He has the best of religions. He's looking at it, he sees the jewel, he says, no, 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 this is a rock, I don't like it. The Christian, he has what? He has the rock. He looks at it, he says, wow, this is a jewel. I have an unbelievable religion. The Wahhabi, he has the best religion in his hand. A Wahhabi, we're saying, one who uh, claims to be a Muslim. Within his hand, he has a jewel. He says, I don't like this jewel. I'm gonna follow the rock. In what way? Ghay. Allah, when he speaks about the munafiqun in the Quran, ones who have the religion, but they choose to stay away from it, Allah comes and says, these people have a ghishawa on their heart. Fi qulubihim ghishawa. On their heart, there is what? There is a, there is a cover, there is a veil, there is a bridge, there is a gap between him and himself. Ghishawa. He has Islam, but he says, no, 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 I don't like it. I'm going to go and blow people up. Allah comes and says, Man qatala nafsan, ka'annama qatala nasa jami'a. He who kills one person, it's as if he's killed all of people. But he says, you know what, I'm going to create my own religion. You see, this whole idea of Wahhabism, it was a ideology created in the 1800s by a British man by the name of Hanfer, who was sent to the, to the Islamic world to begin to instill these ideas. Even in his book, The Confession of a British Spy, read this book, unbelievable. It gives us the whole ideology of how Wahhabism came into existence. He said that he would be sent there, he would instill wrong ideas in the world, and within the Muslim idea, people begin to buy it before you knew it, Wahhabism came into existence. And it's very interesting that you'll see the roots of Wahhabism are the same ones who are claiming to go against Wahhabism. Look at the, look at the, the sick disease, the, the trick. They instill the disease, then they claim to be the ones fighting it. So as in when they removed Saddam, they would do an interview with one man who made a very interesting comment, an Iraqi man, they told him, what do you think about removing Saddam? Was it good what we did? He would reply by saying, it's about time you cleaned up your mess, meaning you instilled him, all you, your father, the father put him, the son came and removed him, really, we didn't do it, we're back to square one. Therefore, what is the disease they do? They instill it, they throw the germ, and then they begin to have the cure. Well, you're the same one who came and instilled the disease. What are you doing? You'll see, it's all a trick, it's a game. Therefore, Wahhabism came into existence because they said, no, no, we don't have a jewel, this is a rock, we want our own religion. That's why you'll see within Wahhabism, things which are exact contrary to Islam. Even the man himself, you see, Abu Hanif, he says that I saw Imam Salah going down in wudu, I want to go up. I saw him going down, I'm going to go up. He even says, his hand is down, I'm going to fold. Exact opposite. They even say, he said, in sujood, I don't know, was Imam Sadiq's eyes closed or open? So I opened one and I closed another. 
I'll do the exact opposite. يغيرون الكلمة. Allah comes and says, connect the dots. What do they do? يقطعون ما أمر الله بها يوصل. Allah comes and says, مؤمنين are ones who يصلون ما أمر الله بها يوصل. They connect what Allah wants to be connected. What does he do? He comes and he disconnects it. يقطعون ما أمر الله بها يوصل. Why? Because he's not interested in the religion of Allah. They come with his own religion. أرأيت الذي تخذ إلهه وهو Allah comes and says, he comes and he creates his own religion. Allah says, أَتُعَلِّمُونَ اللَّهُ بِدِينِكُمْ Do you teach Allah with your religion? When he created religion, you're simply supposed to come and follow it. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. He sees himself as so great, so arrogant, that he says, I'm going to teach Allah the religion. Allah isn't going to teach me yet. Therefore, what do you see the problem is within Wahhabism? They may have action, but they lack direction. See, Islam is made of two elements, action and direction. I can do unbelievable things. I can build a hospital like an atheist, for example. He'll build hospitals, but there's no direction. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, your a'mal are questionable because there's no direction in it. A Wahhabi, you'll see, he may have the entire Quran memorized. He may have the most flourishing of beers. He has the best shash, the longest sibha, Quran memorized from cover to cover. Yet you'll see there's no direction. Hajj is simply a means to wilaya. Hajj is simply a means. It prepares you. Hajj is seen as physical, but wilaya is spiritual. It's Hajj that prepares you. It's the means for the understanding of wilaya. That's why they say one day a man, he would come to Imam Salih after he went to Hajj. He would say, is that enough? He would say, no. Now go and visit Abu Abdullah. What is he saying? He's saying Hajj is the preparation. It's when society is, sure, it's like when you have these cars when we were kids. You turn around, you turn that thing around and you wait for it and it begins to bat, it launches right away. You, you tweak it or you twist it and instantly it begins to ride. Hajj, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he was going around for 5,000 years. Adam going around, Nuh going around, Musa going around, Isa going around. What were they doing? They were churning it, churning it, churning it. That until Wilaya comes, it will begin to blast off. Hajj is simply preparation. That's why you'll see, you have a physical Kaaba, then you have a spiritual Kaaba. The physical Kaaba is a preparation for the spiritual Kaaba. You have a silent Quran, then you have a speakable Quran. What do I mean in regards to the Kaaba? Kaaba, you have a physical Kaaba. Today found in Saudiya. Yet Ali ibn Abi Talib comes in and says, or the Prophet says in reference to Ali, Ali yunfikum kal Kaabati fil Islam. Ali to you is like the Kaaba. You have the silent Quran, but that's not enough. You see, many people in the world today, they stick to the silent Quran. Allah said that's not enough. Silent Quran is a reference and a bridge to the speakable Quran. Where Ali comes in and says, Quran I'm the speakable Quran. You see, in Safiyyin, he would come and he would tell them, don't fight them. This is a trick. They're raising the Quran. I mean, continue to fight them. Imam Amir would tell them. They would tell me, oh, Ali, what do you mean fight them? They have the Quran raised on spears. How could we fight them? <laughs> He would say, that's the silent Qur'an. I'm the speakable Qur'an. Mm. I tell you what to do. They're using the Qur'an as a tactic for you to think they're believers. That's why you'll see from there the Khawarij were created. The same exact philosophy. Notice, notice how it all connects together. Khawarij, Wahhabism of today, Khawarij, were created because they neglected what? The speakable Qur'an. Allah comes in and says, you cannot you cannot build a gap between the two. Hajj is not enough. Connect it with wilaya. That's why you'll see in Hajj, you can you go around the Kaaba. Yeah, Ali ibn Abi seen as a spiritual Kaaba. Furthermore, you see Hajj, you go seven times back and forth between Safa and Marwa, rock and rock. Yeah, you go to Karbala, Allah says the sign of do tawaf between Al Hussein and Abbas. You see, you're there in Hajj. You remember Ismail alayhi salam, who was the Dabih, the one who was supposed to be sacrificed. Allah comes and says, that's not enough. Go to Karbala and remember Imam al Hussein, the Dabih of Al Muhammad. Notice how it all comes together. Therefore, Allah comes and says, you may have action, but that's not enough. You have to have direction. Many Shia even, let's not only point fingers at others, many Shia, they have direction. We love Ali, we love Hussein, but there's no action. They'll see, you'll see the Wahhabi has action but no direction. Many Shia, they have direction but there's no action within the book, or there's no what? Action. That's why Imam Salih alayhi salam, he says, don't call yourself one of the Shia if you don't pray Salat al -Layl. Meaning action is what's important. That's why within the whole Quran, Allah, how many times does he say, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ those who have Iman and also do good things, meaning Iman without faith, without action, is, is, is basically there's no importance to it. And also action without faith is also something which is unacceptable. That's why when Allah speaks about in reference to those 
who think they're doing good, but in essence they're doing evil, you see the Wahhabi, he says, the more people I kill, the closer I'll be to the Prophet. It's almost as if a person, he's driving, and he doesn't have the right directions. A lot of times you'll be driving, you don't know where you're going. You drive, you drive, you think you're getting closer to the destination, but in essence you're only getting further. You'll see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he speaks about these kinds of people within the whole Quran, in the verse I referred to in the beginning of the Majlis. Allah says, الَّذِينَ ظَلَّ سَعْيُهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ صُنْعًا Notice the verse. Allah says, you'll find people who do good things in this world thinking they're doing good. يَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّهُمْ يُحْسِنُونَ صُنْعًا This يَحْسَبُونَ is a viral one. They think they're doing good. Christianity fell in this يَحْسَبُونَ They think, you can't do anything, you have to verify it. Wahhabism, they think, no, no, it's not enough. You have to verify it. Therefore, you'll see, the Wahhabi, he fell in what? غِشَاوَة The Christianity fell in ضَلَالَة when you come to the respected Jewish brethren, neither does he have a rock, nor does he have a jewel, but he says, look, I have everything. You tell him, Habibi, there's nothing there. No, 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 no. We, we're the chosen ones. You tell him, brother, there's, there's nothing in your hand. I'm sorry to break it for you. No, no, no. Yet Allah maghlula. Allah has hand. Allah doesn't know what he's talking about. Musa, Musa doesn't know. We are, we are Musa. We are, the, we are greater than Musa. Tell them there's nothing there. Therefore, you'll see Judaism today, they're a minority. Why? Because they're not interested in, separate, in spreading Judaism. You'll see Jews rarely go from door to door. They're not interested. They say, for you to be a Jew, you have to be born a Jew. They're not interested in spreading the teachings of Judaism. Why? Because we're chosen. Therefore, you'll see. Now, when I speak about Judaism, it's with respect. Zionism is different than Judaism. Judaism, there's a lot of truth to it. And we respect our Jewish brethren and we'll sit with them. And if a Jew is killed, we the Muslims first will go and do protests against the killing of the Jews. Judaism is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts on a pedestal. We respect Judaism. Zionism, on the other hand, is something which is evil. Zionism is the one which I'm referring to, which has no rock and no jewel. They say, we are the chosen ones. You'll see him, he's killing children in Palestine, and he believes that he is the Mahloum. You'll see, for example, this man, Netanyahu, he would go up there and he would speak as if he is the one who has haq. I say, Allahu Akbar, from your hand, blood is being spilled. Because of your children being killed, yet you still believe you have haq? Allah comes in and says, look at it, it's very clear. He thinks he's untruth, but he's the epitome of evil. Therefore, you'll see, it's almost as if you have three salesmen. The first person, he has a great product, but he says, I don't have a good product, really, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't buy what I have. This is the Muslim. The Christian, the product isn't so good. He comes in, he says, my product, if you buy it, you're gonna have the best time of your life. You'll see the product, it's not the best. The Zionist, not the Jew, the Zionist on the other hand, does, he doesn't have a product and he says, please come to me, I have everything, it's the best, trust me, 100%, no guarantee, it's, it's the best. Allah Ta'ala, what does he say? He says, the Jews come and say the Christians aren't on any truth. The Jews say that the Christian has nothing. The Christian, Allah comes the mission to the Quran. The Christian comes and says, Laysat al Yahud wa ala shay. The Jews have nothing. Allah then comes and tells us, What does the Muslim say? Does he have does he say the Christian has nothing and the Jew has nothing? You see, Christianity comes and says, You only enter heaven if you believe in Jesus. Judaism comes and says, You only enter heaven when you believe in Musa. Islam, what does it say? It says, I can't enter heaven if I don't believe in Musa or in Jesus. Look at the universal approach that comes with, as we mentioned within the analysis of Armageddon, the universality. They come and say, Laysa The Jews, they don't have anything. The Christians, they don't have anything. Allah then He says, Those who have no truth and no understanding, Muslims who have no understanding, Allah comes and says, they also say that we are the chosen ones. Shaheed Mubahari makes a very interesting comment. He says, the Christians come and say they're right, they're not. The Jews come and say they're right, they're not. The Shia come and say they're right, they're not. He says the Quran is right. Let's see what the Quran says. Many times we're interested in making our religion seem as if it's the best. Allah says Quran. Quran is the basis. Quran is the foundation. Notice Allah continues. He says, what does Islam say? Islam comes and says, Allah will judge. You'll see in very interestingly. He'll judge others before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah Himself. He says, I wait until Yom al Qiyamah to judge you. Who are you to judge man before I did? Look at the universe. Now, what is the solution? When I come and I say, 
Wahhabism has ghay, for example, right? Christianity fell in dhalala. Judaism fell in maghdubi alayhim. They have been doomed because they insistently and stubbornly went away from the teaching. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? What is the solution? Allah says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَىٰ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنِكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدْ إِلَىٰ اللَّهِ Allah comes and says, say, O people of the book, come to an agreement, not even become Muslims. When I say these kind of things, do I want the Christian to come to Islam? No, no. We're not interested in bringing people to Islam. Allah guides. When I say, O Jew, you have fell in this trap, am I trying to defame Judaism so they come to Islam? No, no. We're not interested in proselytizing Islam. We don't want to spread Islam. What do we come and say? We simply come and say, go back to true Christianity. So we say, go back to true Judaism. You'll see, for example, Judaism comes and says, there is one God. Why have you come and separated God into a number of parts? Allah comes and says that the Bible comes and says one God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4. Even in Matthew, you'll see in the book of 12. God is one. God is one. All I'm saying is don't come to Islam. Go back to true Christianity because true Christianity is Islam. That's why you'll see when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala... He comes and he speaks about these kinds of things within the Holy Quran. He comes and he says, just come to a word of agreement. Why did you go away from true Christianity? Today, with all due respect, you're going to a... Notice how they come and they create Allah. Notice when Tawheed is out of the picture, everything begins to fall apart. The universal system begins to collapse. The pieces become out of place. Everybody wants Allah to be his. And I don't say this comically, with all due respect, and this is a reality. You go to a Christian church with our, for our black brethren, you'll see Jesus is African-American. You see Jesus is black, no problem. You go to a Chinese church, you'll see Jesus all of a sudden, his eyes have been stretched, and Jesus has become a, a Chinese. You go to a, a white church, and you'll see all of a sudden, the eyes of Jesus have become blue, his, his hair has become curly, and the skin is white, and all of a sudden, Jesus has almost, he looks as if he was born in, you know, South, South California. Allah comes and says, the minute you mess around with Tawheed, and it's not only with them, all times with them, today, the same thing. You'll see, for example, how we begin to nationalize Ahlul Bayt, salam. We begin to culturalize Ahlul Bayt. You'll go into a Iraqi center, Imam Al Hussein looks Iraqi, right? You go into a different center, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he looks, for example, Iranian or Persian. Same, same exact ideology. Allah says, don't nationalize. Make it something universal. Tawheed, notice when Allah speaks about Tawheed in the Quran, He says, قُلْ يَا أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ O people of the book, come. All I say to the Christian is, why did you change the oneness of Allah? Jesus, you love Him so much. Jesus says, God is one. Moses, you love Him so much. Just Follow the teachings of Jesus. When I say Islam comes, all I say is that Islam preserved true Christianity. True Judaism is found within the Quran. You'll see beautifully within Quran or within the Bible, I'm sorry, you can establish the, the Islam. You can establish Islam within the Bible. Within the Torah, you can establish Islam. Within Sunni books, you can establish Shi'azam. But they cannot establish their teachings through our book. Notice the point. A Christian, I can come and prove Islam through the Bible itself. God is one, prophethood. John 16, for example, the, the comforter will come after me. I can prove it through the Bible, but the Christian can't prove Christianity through the Quran. Notice the universality Islam comes in. Therefore, all Allah says is Tawheed. Please, brothers and sisters, when we have discussions with Christians, all that should be mentioned is Tawheed. This is the essence, this is the bedrock, the foundation. One Allah, you'll see when Tawheed is removed out of the picture, all problems begin to take place. All problems are result when Tawheed is out of the picture. You'll see man becomes, he wants to have everything. Today you go to countries, you'll see statues of presidents. Man, it's all, forget Allah, Tawheed is out of the picture. Man becomes Allah, because you have God and man. Remove God, man becomes God. You have God in man. Remove God in San himself. He begins to see himself as God. Pharaoh saw himself as God because he removed God from the picture. You go, for example, to countries. You'll see everybody wants to be the president. Everybody wants to be the leader. The <coughs> irony is where everybody wants to be the leader, but very few are qualified. Everybody wants to be out there. He wants to be about me. I want to be in charge. But the irony is that very few people are qualified. Where did all these problems come from? Tawheed. They removed Tawheed because Tawheed is what? Tawheed is not only a theological thing. When I believe in one God, I become one. And we're going to expound on this in tomorrow's mention this, but to give a brief um, uh, pointer. When I believe God is one, 
I become one as a human being. My senses become united. I don't begin to do things for me personally. Everything becomes channeled towards Allah. Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib, for example, in the blessed battle of, of Khaybar when he's fighting Amr ibn Wood, and there he is sitting on his chest. He stands up, he walks around for a few moments. He would then go and defeat him. He would go back to the tents. People would tell him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, you stood up. He went around for a few minutes and then he went and finished him. Why? What's the wisdom behind it? You don't do anything except if there's wisdom. He would say, when I was on the chest of Amr, he spat at my face. If I was to kill him at that moment, I would have killed him for the sake of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Yeah, I stood up, I turned around for a few moments, and I went and I killed him for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is Tawheed. Tawheed is when everything, look at Ibrahim alayhi salam, everything is channeled towards Allah. Ibrahim comes and says, Inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyai wa mamati lillah. Everything is child for Allah. When I believe in one God, I become one. My goal becomes one. My vision becomes one. Furthermore, one God means one society. The main problem, why you have nationality problems, tribalism, you'll see sectarian issues, gender issues, you'll see arrogance, imperialism, all of these issues are simply stems from a neglection of Tawheed. Because when one God is removed out of the picture, society is no longer one as well. Society begins to break into different categories. That's why in the Holy Quran, Allah comes and says, Ya ayuhan nas, إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرُ وَأُنْثَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَخَبَائِلَ لِتَعَارَفُوا إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عَنْدَ اللَّهُ تَقَاكُمْ Allah says, O man, we've created you from male and female nations and tribes, not so you can segregate. One of the biggest problems is when we begin to use our differences to segregate, whereas Allah gave us differences so we can assimilate. Allah gave man differences. I see a brother, for example, in front of me. I see he, for example, speaks French, let's say. Allah says there's a difference in him, so you're intrigued by his difference and to go and establish a relationship with him. That's why you'll see when you want to build the house, you'll have the one who builds the window, the one who does the roof, one who does the electricity, one who does the heat, one who comes and works on the kitchen. If everybody was, his job was to do the window, you'll see a house would never be completed. Allah comes and says he has something which you don't, you have something which he doesn't. Combine each other from there a perfect system will be established. That's why you'll see even when the times of Arabia, people with differences would be ridiculed. Whereas Rasulullah would say, no, no, honor them for their differences. You'll see Salman al Farisi, rather Salman al Muhammadi, he would come to the Holy Prophet of Islam and he would tell him, Ya Rasulullah, Salman is ridiculing me or Quraysh is ridiculing me for me being from Persia. I don't know what tribe I'm from. They would come to him, they would tell him, Salman, which tribe do you come from? He would say, I don't know, I'm Persian. Persians aren't very prominent in, within tribalism, these kinds of things. It's not so important within the world of Persia. Therefore, he'd come to him, he would tell him, Ya Rasulullah, they're making fun of me, what should I do? He would say, oh Salman, go quickly tell them that if you're not from the tribes of Arabia, I am from the tribe known as Islam. Oh, wow. Notice the words. He said, I may not be from a certain tribe, but I'm a Muslim. Meaning what? You are Arabian. You may be from the tribe of Quraysh. You may be the cousin of the Prophet. You may be the uncle of the Prophet. And you may go to hell. And you, oh one who's seen as the son of the Caliph, you may be going to heaven. Meaning Allah doesn't see it as lineage. He simply sees it as action. That's why Mutanabbi, the one of the greatest poets, the Arab poet, he comes and he says, Laysa al-fata man qala kana abi, inna al-fata man qala ha anadha. He says the youth isn't one who comes and says, my father was. I come from the same religion, my culture, my lineage. No, no. Inna al-fata man qala ha anadha. He says the true youth is the one who says, here I am. Meaning honor isn't found through lineage and descent. Rather, honor is found through actions, dignity, and respect. Let's let the world know about this importance of Tawheed. But initially, we must understand it before we can give it to the world. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma kulli walika al-hujjat ibn al-hasan. Salawatuka alayhi wa ala Yeah.
with the loudest of your voices. These are the last nights we have of the holy month of Ramadan. Nearly three nights left, subhanAllah. All 30 nights are coming to an end. Let us use these last few nights to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow the rest of the year to be a successful year for us, inshallah. And may you jeep with the loudest of your voices three times all together. Bismillah Before a salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.